Hello, my name is Sean, and I'm going to be doing a workshop update for all the Ansible Automation workshops for our new version, Ansible Automation Platform 2. So, all the workshops I'm talking about today are available on github.com slash ansible slash workshops. The main audience member for this is going to be Red Hat employees and partners. However, there is a sizable community using this, as you can see, in the favorites and the likes and et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to make sure this was completely public for partners and whoever else might find this video. If you are an employee or partner or part of the Red Hat ecosystem, you can use the RHPDS system, the Red Hat product demo system. When you log in, you'll see that the new labs are black with a white A and they're prepended with AAP2, indicating Ansible Automation Platform 2. The older labs will run in conjunction for a little bit. I think we're gonna to try to deprecate them out in about a month. They have a red A in refer to Ansible Automation Platform 1.2, which corresponds to Ansible Tower. So what has changed between AAP 1.2 and AAP 2? We have Ansible Tower is no more. It is involved into a new tool called Automation Controller. Automation controller is kind of the evolution, but it's more than what Tower was. It actually has support for things like execution environments, which leads us to the next point is Ansible Engine 2.9 is no more. We move on to what we call execution environments and they use Ansible Core 2.11 under the hood for all three supported ones that we work with today. There's also a new command line tool called Ansible Navigator and there's VS Code and developer tooling. Important notes here is we're trying to we're going to try to deprecate AAP 1.2 in probably mid-November or it'll probably get extended a little bit, but I want to deprecate AAP 1.2 as fast as we can. Um, it's just not really a reason to keep it around now that we have AAP 2. So I think the first thing I'll talk about is the workshops are a collection themselves. There's a lot of nice roles in there they can reuse outside of the workshop or if you're just trying to populate things that the workshop has into your own demo environment or whatever you have. For example, we do SSL certs for Tower using Let's Encrypt. So whether you're using Tower or Controller, you could just reuse our role to go ahead and put an SSL cert on Automation Controller. Here's a, a big major changes that affect all the different workshop types. The license has changed, so there's no longer a license.json file. This has moved towards a manifest. You'll see in our YouTube channel that Colin McNaughton has put together a video explaining how to do a manifest.zip, and you'll kind of see this as entitlements or subscription. That word license doesn't really matter anymore, um, but you'll have to understand what a manifest.zip does, and this kind of mirrors the behavior you see in other Red Hat products. So this puts Ansible back in compliance with other Red Hat products. Um, the other thing that's changed is the bundled installer is behind a login window with access.redhat.com. It's really easy to get a login to access.redhat.com or get a trial subscription. Um, so what we can do now is I've made a programmatic role that's part of that workshops collection, ansible.workshops.aap download, and you can get the bundled installer. To go with that, we've also created an Ansible Workshops AAP repo role. This will turn that bundled installer into a repo on a specific node. Uh, we use the control node as we're setting up kind of programmatic uh, automatic changes to uh, automation controller. So what this will allow you to do is kind of pin uh, install of Ansible Navigator or other tools as they come along to that bundled repo. So everything in that ap.tar.gz file that we have under access downloads, that has everything you need. It's not just tower, it's not just controller, it's builder, it's navigator, it's every little tool that we bundled together into one easy installer and then this just mounts it as a repo so you can easily kind of do a yum install. Ansible Navigator, this is a big change is we're no longer using the ansible-playbook command or ansible ad hoc commands is everything uses ansible navigator that has supports for execution environments. So you'll kind of see that, that all of the different labs have kind of an introduction to what ansible navigator is and how to take that ansible playbook knowledge and apply it to the new command line tool navigator, which also includes an interactive mode. So the launch page has changed. If you have launching websites, you might have remembered this old AP 1.2 launch page that was made a long time ago. I've basically changed this to a new CSS template to match 
the um, documentation guide in Ansible.com and kind of match the color looks and feels to make us more kind of in line. It also kind of helped changing it here so it's really clear when you're on AAP 1.2 versus AAP 2. The documentation guide has changed a lot too. It's kind of hard to tell in the screenshot, but you'll notice there's a new top menu that's changed. There's new kind of green little highlights for notes. So when you do block quotes within documentation, it's gonna highlight it a bit easier. You'll also notice kind of in this text field that the Google source is a lot easier to see for Red Hat employees and partners if they're trying to find the Google slides. And again, here's a call out. His Red Hat internal slides are here. These can be shared on an individual basis with folks outside the company or partners. It's just not defaulting to that. So we provide the PDF for the community and people that don't have access to that. You can ask Red Hat employees to share that with you individually. There's no intent to hide it. It's just the default kind of behavior of Google Slides. We've also implemented syntax highlighting that's changed to make the workshops look and follow along a lot easier. So I kind of tried five different little kind of open source uh, syntax highlighters for websites. And this one seemed to work the easiest and it's easy to change kind of different, uh, different themes. So right now I chose a pretty basic dark theme. Everyone on the technical marketing team in Ansible kind of prefers the dark theme. So I just chose a dark theme to go. But the Prism library is really simple to use. And basically all of the exercise examples are much easier to see. Uh, I'm sure this is, is um, a little bit more arbitrary and kind of depends upon the person's opinion, but I like having kind of color coded in there. Um, we've also moved towards a more prescriptive approach with Visual Studio Code. I don't think it was clear based on feedback from community customers, uh, solution architects. So we're very clear that we want and prefer people to use Visual Studio Code. We provide SSH as a backup, but we kind of want to create a prescriptive solution here. So it's really easy for people that are novices to Ansible that they know how to do things and easily follow along. Most people don't actually know how to use VI or Nano or command line tools. Not only are they learning Ansible for the first time, but they might be learning Linux tooling for the first time. So we're trying to lower that barrier to entry. Um, now I'm gonna get into kind of individual workshop changes, um, less about the overlap. So in the rel workshop, they've now removed ad hoc commands. Um, they use the EE supported rel eight execution environment, which is pre-bundled with all the supported content. So there's no special EE needed. And now RHEL Workshop was one of the odd ones where we didn't have the solution guides in there, so now that's been added. The Network Workshop, which I'm in charge of, um, all of them have moved to using fully qualified collection names. So instead of like iOS Facts, as an example, we use cisco.ios.fax. You can use the short name. This allows us to use that collection versus using the old built-in batteries included model with Ansible 2.9. I've also deprecated a, a Jinja exercise. I did update it for AAP2, but it's moved to supplemental exercises. And now we have a resource module exercise that we default to training. There's also a new supplemental exercise on a little bit more deep diving for resource modules. I could have made like five exercises on resource modules. So I kind of just moved one of them into the supplemental. And then we also only use the EE supported RHEL 8 on the network workshops. So everything's included. So Security Workshop has changed a bunch of uh, different items along here. This is kind of like a highlight reel of this that Craig Brandt has supplied me, who's in charge of the Security Automation Workshop, is they talk about security use case definitions and highlighting at a higher level of kind of explaining what's going on here. It explains the workshop execution environment for security because some of the collections are partner certified collections and not ones maintained by Red Hat. We actually supply an execution environment for the workshop, but you would have to build that in your own environment. So Craig has created some slides around that content. It also gets into tooling basics. So I think all the workshops are doing this is talking about Navigator, talking about the text user interface. Uh, the diagrams have been updated um, for each of the use cases. And then there's been some more deep dives in explaining the technology, not assuming that someone might know what Snort is. The security workshop changes. Um, continue on is the default appliance credentials are accessed on every page to make it really easy to understand what's going on. There's personas, oh, I went forward. There's personas here to understand who's the persona for these different tools and what it's used for and how to kind of uh, 
get rid of IP addresses and use DNS names. So it's really apparent for different students what's going on. There's also navigation. This existed for the RHEL and network workshop, but not the security ones. We've just added kind of next exercises. And then there's some improved diagrams that are continually being iterated on. So you'll see that kind of updated over time. Finally, last but not least, the Windows Workshops had some major changes. Colin McNaughton has changed out GitLab with Git EA. I don't know if it's pronounced Git EA or Git EA, so I'm sure someone can make fun of me in the comments. Um, this also improves provision time. It reduces some of the complexity of booting the GitLab images the way we were doing it. In this case, they're also using a custom execution environment. There was some stuff that uh, Colin wanted to grab that still wasn't fully part of the included collection. So there's a Windows execution environment that he includes in there. There's some updated doc guides and some updated uh, alerting. So basically what this means is we're CI testing, not just workshop provisioning and deprovisioning, but we're actually gonna be testing the actual exercises so that if we notice something changes or some requirement changes, we can be a little bit more proactive and keep workshop outages from happening. So I have a bunch of links for more help. There is a new 100% free course that Red Hat employees, Red Hat partners, the community, customers, prospected customers, anyone, right, can use. It's completely free. This is DO007. It is a basics course. This follows the RHEL workshop. Kind of think of it as the six hour workshop condensed in two to three hours. Um, this is me actually teaching it, but if there's questions or specifics about how would you teach this or what does this mean or how do you speak to it, it's basically just a recording of me on the technical marketing team going through our decks for that specific course. There's also a new YouTube video we put together about accessing the workbench and using Visual Studio Code to make that much easier to understand of like how we expect students to work. That This link also will appear on the launch page. Um, and then we encourage people, please do not email the TMM team. Please open issues. This allows the community, it allows partners, it allows Red Hat employees to interact in an open format and understand what's going on. We will miss emails and they don't get tri triaged, meaning like the emails are just gonna sit in one of our inboxes and never get looked at. It's not because we don't find it important, it's because we just don't have a workflow that's going to support email. It's just not a tenable solution. So please, please, please open issues. And thank you for watching this talk. I know it's not relevant for everyone, but I wanted to put it on YouTube to make it easy. Smash that like button, subscribe for more. And as Craig always tells us, thank you for automating.